standard for scammers with a question mark because uh, that's what we're trying to find out. Um, I won't be giving a presentation today because uh, that's usually not what I do, but I will tell you a story. And with this story, I'm going to take you on an epic journey from Holland here to Belgium, to our capital of Europe, to uh, Portugal, and all the way back to Latvia. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, let me start by telling you a little bit about me. Um, I have a background in electrical engineering, that's what I uh, studied. Um, and um, in 2002, I founded my uh, company Cloudware, and I'm a technical consultant, and everyone always asks me, so what is it that you do? And that's a difficult question, because in the word cloud next to my name, you can see it's quite a lot. Um, so what I usually say is I go to mostly non-technical companies and I help them with their technical uh, questions. Um, about 10 years ago, I also uh, started uh, working with uh, uh, VoIP services. And um, uh, I think as far as I know, and please do correct me later if you know that I'm wrong, uh, as far as I know, I'm the only telco in, in Europe that is providing emergency services 112 uh, in every member state in Europe. Um, if you want to talk to me later, after the talk, you can uh, find me in the, in the Swiss village here at uh, May Containers. All right, um, so uh, a while ago I was working for a customer, and the customer um, wanted a PSD2 product. Um, so I started working on that, and um, while I was working for that, I thought, okay, what is it exactly? Now? Well, PSD2 is a payment service directive. It's uh, active since 2019. And uh, for those who are you know, familiar or outside of the EU, a directive is a document that is crafted in uh, Brussels by the uh, European Commission. And that document has to be implemented in law in every different member state in Europe. That is very important. It is implemented in every member state in Europe. I'll get to that later. Um, it, is, uh, it is mainly uh, used, it, it's, it's meant to drive innovation because in the old days you needed to be a bank to, in order to provide financial services. Um, and um, now you can also register yourself as a payment institution. And a payment institution is uh, not someone who is a bank or a credit card company, uh, but it still has very strict capital and risk management requirements. And I'll definitely get back to that later, because that's very important in this talk. So let me focus a little bit on how Holland does this, because that's where I'm from and I know the most of it. In Holland, the body that regulates this is called the Nederlandse Bank, the Dutch National Bank. I'll just call it for now DNB, because that's, that's less Dutch and more international. Uh, and uh, the DNB uh, says, okay, so first you have to draft all these documents, you know, prove stuff and uh, provide information to us, and then we're going to make a decision about that. And the decision is going to take minimum three, of three months. So, okay, that's quite some time, but okay, it's, it's still doable. The price, they didn't want to be too specific about it. But I do understand from people in the industry that it is, uh, you can buy a really nice car from it, and a really nice car. So, uh, yeah, it's not cheap to get a PSD2 license in Holland. Um, and then there's a document, and the document says which requirements do you have if you want to uh, have a PSD2 license in Holland. And the document is eight pages long, uh, and it is basically just refers to, to law. Um, so it is very, very extensive. And I just picked four out of them, because otherwise we wouldn't have enough in 30 minutes here. Uh, let me have a look at the first one. It's uh, Article 3.9 from the Wet op Financial Toezicht, so the law that governs uh, uh, financial uh, institutions. 
And it says you need to have a reliable decision maker. In other words, if you have a criminal record or something like that, you cannot be a board member of, uh, of the company that uh, wants a PSD2 license. Okay, that makes sense. You, know, you don't want, uh, for example, scammers uh, to have a banking license. You have to register everything in procedures. Um, that, well, everyone who has an ISO certification knows how difficult that can be. Um, so the three months is definitely a minimum. It, it probably takes a lot longer to get one of these uh, 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 licenses in Holland. And there was one very interesting one. All your employees have to take an oath. And yeah, I was a bit interested in that. Um, so I'm not sure what the oath says, uh, but it specifically said that all your employees have to take an oath if you want to have this license. Uh, never seen that before. Um, the article 117 was also interesting. That basically says that uh, you have reasonable wages. And it doesn't state that, but I'm guessing it's not on the low end of the wages, but it's probably board members who cannot make three or four times more than the whole revenue of a year for this uh, company. Um, which also makes sense, because you don't want specific people to withdraw all the money from that uh, uh, company and then uh, go bankrupt or something like that. It creates huge problems. You want to have trust in financial institutions. So actually, this is a very good idea. This is how you would want to do it. Don't make it too easy, but do create options for fintechs to create financial uh, products. So then I thought, um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. Can it be done easier? Um, and then I thought of a, of a different law. And um, I thought of Lisbon. And Lisbon is a... It's a nice city, you know, nice people, good food, and good wine, and better weather than Holland. Um, but Lisbon has something else. It has the Lisbon Treaty, and specifically Article 56 of the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and this article says that, um, <clears throat> and I'll just read this, within the framework, restrictions on freedom to provide services within the Union shall be prohibited in respect of nationals of member states who are established a member state other than that of the person of whom the service are intended. In other words, I can buy this service anywhere in the Europe, European Union and maybe there's a different member state where these PSD2 rules are less strict. Um, that would be nice. So I started looking and I promise you we're going on a journey today, so let's go to, uh, to Latvia. And uh, Latvia is a member of the European Union, and they, therefore they provide PSD2 services. And I found a reseller of PSD2 services. So I went to this reseller, and I said, uh, this sounds interesting, this is exactly what I want, so um, how can I, you know, become a customer of yours. And I said, oh, just go online and, you know, fill out your email address, choose a password, and you're good to go. And I said, oh, that sounds fantastic. I said, so how much does it cost? And I was thinking about this nice car, right? And they were like, um, let's see, do you need uh, more data with that? So do you want to know for specific data if it was a transaction for a supermarket or something like that? And I was like, no, no, no. I said, I just want the raw data itself. And I said, oh, that's fine. Then it's free. I was like, oh, interesting. So, um, so basically, I went from, you know, big six figures plus a lot of work to five minutes of work and uh, zero euro. I thought, okay, fantastic. So um, then I thought, so I have this capability now and um, I should test it. You know, and so I called up my, uh, my friend, Bob, there you go. And I said, uh, Bob, uh, you know, um, can I try to hack your bank account? And uh, well, Bob is a, is a nice guy, he's smart, and this is the person who would never click on a scamming or phishing link. So, uh, so I thought it will be difficult, but you know, everyone have, uh, has everything online. So I checked out his LinkedIn, I checked out his social media, and I have a lot of information about him. I know his address, I know his date of birth, full name, where he works, everything. So I was like, interesting. So let's 
create an email where I say, don't fill out any information, because that's what scammers do. Don't do that. But this is the information we have about you. Can you please confirm this? Um, and I thought it's a long shot, you know. He will never do this. And it was a few weeks after I talked to him, so he was probably already forgot it. So I thought, he will never click on it. And um, yeah, I was wrong. Um, you don't have to read this, but this is the raw data that I got from his bank account. I literally got all his bank accounts, all his, uh, 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 how much money was in the bank accounts, and literally every transaction of the past year of, uh, of his bank account. And just go, I'll go over a few of them. Um, because, well, it's difficult to see, but you'll probably have to check it out later on the, uh, on the streams, uh, uh, the stored streams online. But there are int some interesting information in there. For example, I know that he's going to Albert Heijn every day between 7 and 8. So you're like, so why is this important? Well, you know, you can imagine that for some people, this could be a security issue. I don't know. Uh, ministers, stuff like that, you know. Um, so for some people, you don't want to have a specific pattern known. And you can actually get that from this data. Uh, what you can also see that he has uh, Spotify and Netflix, so I'll def definitely have to ask him about that. That's good. Um, uh, there's also a lot of order data in there. So I can actually see that he uh, ordered from Bol.com, which is a Dutch Amazon, basically, uh, with the order number and everything. Uh, and I can also see his, um, um, uh, what, um, um, uh, yeah, I can so actually see his address. Because he paid for his water uh, bill, and the water bill actually was transferred uh, the, the amount of money with the uh, complete address and everything in it. So I know how much water he uses and where he lives and everything. I already knew that, of course, because, you know, I'm Jeroen and I know him. But, you know, scammers could definitely use this in sort of information. This is such uh, an amazing um, source uh, of data. Okay. Um, so, yeah, huge amounts of information. I get raw data for free from Latvia uh, without any certification. I could be a criminal. I could have a criminal record. No one ever asked me about it. Um, yeah, so how difficult is it to do this? Um, well, I already told you, in Latvia, you can get a reseller for PSD2 for, for nothing within five minutes. And then I use some amazing tools, curl, basically. So I just use the REST API of that uh, reseller. Um, then I converted it to CSV uh, for viewing it in, uh, in, uh, in Calc. And um, that's basically it. But, I mean, it's this easy. You could, could do it in any way. You could push it into a Python object or whatever. Um, and um, do it really automatically. So I was thinking, um, is this actually used? And then I thought it, uh, started thinking about, um, about PayPal. Because um, if you go to PayPal, they say you can link your bank account, right? And in uh, the old days, they transfer two amounts of money to you, like one cent and five cents. And then you had to fill out zero, one, zero, five, and then your bank account is, is matched to, to your, LinkedIn account, uh, to your uh, PayPal account. Uh, not anymore. So what they now say is link your bank account. You say, choose your bank. And in Holland, it looks like this. Um, I just choose my bank, and then um, it says this. And now it becomes really interesting, um, because this text actually says, this is an actual screenshot from, from PayPal, and it says, log in to use your bank account instantly. This will allow us to confirm your bank account details and view balances and transactions in your bank account anytime it's necessary over the next 90 days. We will save and use this data exclusively for fraud prevention and risk management. And to make sure there's enough funds for your PayPal payments. By continuing, you agree to the above permissions. And I was like, aha, I know for sure this is that PSD too. 
Um, so yeah, this is actually used, um, and there's very little scope. Um, I sort of trust PayPal. They're not scammers or anything like that. But it's a lot of data that you're transferring to, to PayPal. And the real question is, do you want this? Or do you still want to you know, pay one and two cents and then just you know, link your bank account that way? I think the latter, obviously. Um, so let me see. Um, yeah, the scope, pretty much everything. And once you have given consent, the consent is valid for 90 days. So, for example, if after 80 days they, they want to know, oh, let's see what in the past 20 days he did, you know, you just, they can again query your bank accounts and get all transactions. And they can do this every day. I think that's a problem. So, conclusion. I do think it's good that something like PSD exists. You know, uh, not just banks who can actually create financial products, but actually have fintechs who create amazing products this way. But I do think that it needs a little bit of, you know, regulation, and especially harmonization and national regulations. It was really weird to see that I went from Holland, where I had to do all this stuff, to, uh, to get this data, and then I just went to Latvia and I said, yeah, here, fine, it's, here it is, without any, ask, any questions asked. So harmonization is, is, is definitely needed here. Um, I do think that the consent has to be more explicit. If we remember this button at PayPal, it's just this big button. Yeah, click here to link your bank account. And no one is going to read this. I mean, South Park explained it pretty, pretty nicely in their episode about uh, consent. So I think, yeah, it should be more explicit. And... Um, it should be easy to withdraw consent. So I tried to query my own bank account later, and, um, and it specifically says, you can always, if you want to, withdraw this consent, and then the 19 days just stops. From, from that moment on, they don't have access to your data anymore. Um, I haven't found this button yet. So I consider myself a pretty technical guy, and I was not able to withdraw consent. So I think there's, a, there's an issue there, too. This should be uh, addressed. Um, yeah. So basically, what I'm saying here is that once the moment you are in this PSD to prison, you won't be pardoned. You're locked in. So let's... There's some time for conf uh, questions, I think. Thanks a lot. And we do have time for questions, so if you have any questions, please line up at the microphones in the middle of the room. Okay, front microphone, please. Hello. Hello. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, okay. I think um, you, there are, could be uh, rather simple uh, solutions to uh, the problem you state. When you uh, go to your bank account and can see which consents you have given, yeah. and also when you go to your bank account and can see who has used that consent, yeah. so that all uh, queries are locked for the for the end user. Absolutely, um, I think everyone from Holland knows the whole discussion with the electronic patient dossier, so all doctors can view your medical information. Um, there's this website, Volgezorg, for example, and at that website you can see which doctor has consent to see your medical data and who has actually queried this data. I think that's a fantastic solution for this, and if you would integrate that with your electronic uh, banking environment, there's your solution. But I do think we should do that uh, European-wide then. Yeah, but thank you very much. Okay, next question, please. Hey, yeah, so this is actually my kind of day job to a certain extent with these kind of things. So um, I work at a financial institution on their side. Um, the PayPal bit that you've demonstrated is actually on the PayPal side, but not the actual scope definition, which goes on the next screen. So you click through. 
PayPal is very greedy with its scopes. It says everything, but you can just do balances, things like that. The thing is, a lot of the banks are integrating it in very different ways. And as you say, there, on some banks, there is no way to withdraw consent or to stop things after that, which is a big problem. But there are other kind of systems out there that, uh, for example, open banking in the UK, where they are very prescriptive, because it seems a lot of things in your talk are um, resellers not doing their proper due diligence on yeah. things, and where the PST2 regulations are quite clear as to who can have access, and the level of compliance and risk training you have to have to actually get access to it. Because I'm, I'm registered for open banking and PST2 and everything, so it's a case of, depending on how you do it, it's better than the alternative, which was screen scraping at the time, but there's a huge amount of, uh, should we say, uh, unification of how you withdraw those rights universally yeah. and make sure that people like PayPal don't use ridiculously greedy scopes yeah. which go and cover everything because I mean usually with um, the way the UK regulator has made it is you have to explicitly say this bank account with this information on the yeah. workflow itself but I think a lot of the things could be solved with that regulator um, in your jurisdiction going to the reseller and saying yeah. don't do that. Yeah, this is of course a little bit the issue in the Europe, uh, um, you know, in the United States of Europe, where you have member states, and everyone is just, you know, doing it a little bit differently. Um, yeah, it is absolutely in PSD2, and you can withdraw uh, uh, your consent, but it, it, the button is very, very hidden. I haven't found it. It's uh, that that is the real issue, of course. You, yeah, the, I think um, with a lot of the uni all those bits, they just need to come up with the unification. <laughs> okay. Do you have? Next one, please. <laughs> okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first a note, if the oath you mentioned is the banker's oath, it's no big deal. Uh, I did it at ING. But my question was, I've been given to understand that PSD2 does not qualify your, um, your, your bank balance as privacy sensitive data. Is that true? Um. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm absolutely sure that all the data that we saw here, his uh, address, his shopping uh, uh, data, order data, stuff like that, I would pretty much say that is personal data. And even if someone pays at a medical institute, you know, for, let's say, for example, he pays at an institute for, for cancer or something like that, I would say that is even the highest level of personal data, um, which I just got for free. So there's definitely an issue there. Okay, yeah. and back microphone, please. So uh, this was a topic that was recently discussed actually on Hacker News because uh -huh. new, new cash comes up every once in a while and then people start talking about alternatives and how to get your actual transactional data as a person. And in general, this was mentioned, uh, preventing people from building any kind of software for um, budget management of their own. Um, could this be a way around it? <laughs> then find a reseller that gives you this data for free. Because like in the Netherlands, yeah. as you mentioned, even I checked like for ABN AMRO, to get the API access, you need to be a business, you need to have stuff, right? So yeah. could this be a way for a simple person to build an open source solution for themselves yeah. and then get that data of a reseller? Or, or is giving that reseller access to your bank account a bad idea? Um, yeah, that's a two-part question. So yes, what you want to do is absolutely possible with this because you could potentially, you know, say, oh, so I'm spending this much in a supermarket and, you know, this much on water and electricity. You can definitely do that with this data. Um, the other part is, how much do you trust this reseller? Um, it's a very difficult question. Um, banks sometimes fail too. Uh, so, <laughs> I would say that's an extremely difficult question. Um, these companies, this reseller, probably goes through the exact same sort of processes that banks go through. So they are reasonably trustworthy, I would say. Um, but yeah, don't go through the Dutch uh, paths to get this data, to build your own open source software. Definitely go for the reselling option there because it's, it's a lot, a lot cheaper. 
Okay, yeah. question Thank from the front. Microphone, please. Um, I've worked with a French company doing uh, open banking. Um, the French banks just don't understand the concept of PSD2. It's generally just the innovation department, which means, yeah, just throw money and, and yeah. play with it. So most of the time, actually, they are not implementing PSD2. What they are actually doing to do open banking is web scrapping your, uh, wow. web, the website of your bank. So the issue is not really PSD2, the issue, at least in France. The issue is uh, that banks are just old oh. companies that don't get anything about the, the thing called internet. Yeah. Yes, but if you create a bank extend like PSD2, and there's something in it like, for example, consent, you know, then implement it, you know, make that button somewhere, uh, maybe even somewhere else on a different website where they can withdraw it. And um, um, yeah, um, but definitely. My point was just do complain to your uh, uh, bank teller. Tell them that their website and their processes is shitty and yeah. maybe someday they will implement PSD2 correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And next question, front microphone, please. Um, just to clarify here. So it looked like you were trying to set up a financial institution in Netherlands, but you were just going through a reseller in Lithuania. Are there similar resellers in Netherlands, or did you try to set up an actual financial institution in yeah. um, or Latvia? My God. Absolutely. There are services like this in Holland. Uh, they do exist. Um, they were rather expensive, um, uh, and also I don't, I, I don't know the quality of them. I would say it's pretty much the same as other, any other reseller of PSD2, um, but it was basically a pricing problem that was uh, here in Holland. Okay. Uh, and this pricing problem was probably also because of the Dutch National Bank, the DNB, because they have this very strict uh, regulations here in Holland. Um, I have the idea that's not the case in Latvia, um, uh, and in Holland there was another issue that um, the customers of my customer have to be onboarded at the reseller here in Holland. So, for example, if you would want to use it for your web shop and you just buy, I don't know, whatever, you know, you buy something, you buy a TV online, then you would have to onboard at the reseller of where we do the PSD2 which was obviously not acceptable because well, then you basically have to check out twice. Um, yeah, so... Um, so the issue is significantly more with the reseller system than PSD2 itself in any capacity? Sorry? So the issue is more with the um, data reseller bits than anything with PSD2 as a legislation? I think it's because of the national implementation of the directives, of the European directives. And I think there's so much leeway there it, uh, it changes dramatically from, from nation to nation. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. and we have time for one last question, so please, Matt Front. So, so if I understood, the, it was ultimately the Latvian inf institution that, granted, that chose to grant you access. Is there any way, can you essentially, so, so essentially that approval, that 90-day approval was just going through this Latvian institution. Is there any way to um, essentially opt out of this so that you, if you have some account you don't want other people in other countries to have access to, they can't. They can. You mean beforehand, before you potentially give a consent that you just opt out, I never want to do this? Yeah. I'm not aware of that. Yeah. Okay, then that's it. I would like to thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Please thank give you. a round of applause. Thank you.